Hello everyone, welcome to the Responsible Logistics podcast. Our today's guest is Mats Hultmann, Head of OEM Partnerships at Neste. Welcome Mats. Thanks, and great to be here. Thank you for coming. Maybe you could introduce yourself a little bit, what you do at Neste and what does Neste do? Yes, so my role as Head of OEM Partnerships is to orchestrate the collaborations with the vehicle industry. So it could be anything from technical collaborations to collaborations in the public affairs area or on the business side. So it's a, it's a mix of the topics that I'm working on. And Nest as a company, uh, we're a world leader in uh, renewable products. So we're the world's biggest producer of renewable diesel, also known as HV100. Mm. Uh, and also the world's lead leading producer of uh, sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, and we're a global player in, the, in this area. Sounds really interesting, especially the renewable <laughs> fuels part. Maybe you could, um, we, we could start from uh, talking about the current market situation and uh, how, where do we stand today with um, fuels, including fossil fuels and uh, renewable fuels that you provide? Yeah, so the current market situation, I mean, we've been in this business for over 15 years and uh, we see a lot of development in a positive way where companies wanting to uh, reduce their greenhouse gas emissions uh, and also countries wanting to do this. So it's uh, really good to see and we also have seen now in, uh, in France and in Germany lately uh, opening up for sales of HV100, which is a good development. As per your evaluation with today's situation on the market, is there a chance for us to actually become sustainable? Uh, yes, I definitely think there is. Uh, there are uh, several good solutions available. Uh, it's more a matter of making the change and deciding to do the switch. Uh, so definitely there is a good uh, potential to do it. Of course, uh, uh, legislation plays a role and can help to make the shift e even quicker. But also uh, we see a strong commitment from many companies uh, to achieve their climate targets and to really help with uh, lowering the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so this combined creates a good environment, uh, but we can always do more, I would say. Okay, and going more into a detailed description of uh, fuel offerings, let's say, uh, what are the main products that we have today on the market that are renewable or sustainable? Yeah, there, there are a couple of different solutions. Uh, so uh, what we do at Neste is uh, our product is Neste My Renewable Diesel, an HV100 product. It's something you could start using already here and now today in any diesel engine. Uh, so it's yeah and widely available. So that's, I would say, one of the good solutions. Uh, then there are a couple of others that also uh, like biomethane and others. Uh, so. Yeah, there are solutions available today that, that can help, uh, but there's also a lot coming or a lot under development also. Mm. But uh, today there are a couple of good sol solutions in combination with uh, what can be done with electrification also. Mm -hmm. Talking about Nesta's products exactly, you provide renewable diesel, right? Which is the same thing as HVO, as I understand. Yes, uh, and this can be a bit confusing, but renewable diesel and HVO is exactly the same thing. It's just different market and countries or segments use different wordings, but it's exactly the same thing. Uh, then there's another product called uh, biodiesel or, uh, or FAME. Uh, that's something completely different. Both are biofuels, but uh, biodiesel pharma is a completely different product. So uh, we are often sort of <laughs> mixed up with this, but it's not the same thing when we compare those. And maybe you could compare those <laughs> just to understand what are the main differences? Yeah, the main differences. Uh, our product is uh, more of a chemical copy of fossil diesel, uh, so it can easily be used uh, and uh, just in, in any diesel engine and it could be stored and same infrastructure can be used. Whereas uh, biodiesel pharma, it comes with some challenges when it comes to storage uh, and also increased uh, service needs and, and, and things like that. Uh, so these are two, two different type of products and you can't uh, use it directly 100% in an engine and so on uh, for, for biodiesel unless the vehicle is specifically approved for it and so on. So yes, there are some differences in between. 
you mentioned that HVO uh, chemical structure, I think, is the same as uh, fossil fuel. But at the same time, uh, we hear and see that HVO helps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by up to 90%. Mm. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but how is it possible if it is the same um, chemical structure? Because for me, it's not very clear. Yeah, yeah, and it's a good question, and it's not so easy to follow what what happened. But uh, the thing with uh, renewable diesel, uh, it's that it's made from renewable raw materials, uh, and the big difference is that uh, when you make diesel, you take fossil oil out of the ground, and you make diesel or gasoline out of it, and you burn it in an engine, and you release CO2 to the atmosphere. And by doing this, you're adding CO2 to the atmosphere. But when you use uh, waste and residue components like we are doing from biological origin, uh, those have absorbed CO2 during their lifetime. And then we make a fuel out of them and we release CO2, but it's not new CO2. We're just circulating CO2. Huh. So, so it's a big difference. And you, you could compare it with a tree. So a tree, when it grows, it absorbs CO2. And then when it dies, it falls to the ground, rottens, and then emits that CO2 back. Mm. So it's circulating CO2. And uh, that's how we achieve uh, this big greenhouse gas reduction by using uh, a, a raw material that doesn't add CO2 to the atmosphere. Okay, so basically fossil fuel emits new CO2 emissions, whereas uh, HVO or other renewable fuels, mm. they just... Uh, sustain the same amount, like they don't produce new Yeah, they don't they add the CO2 to yeah. the atmosphere, it's just circulating it. So okay, that, that's, that's much clearer now. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, let's then talk about the raw materials. Mm -hmm. uh, and I see that you <laughs> yes, <laughs> prepared some to... little presentation mm -hmm. here. Uh, could you explain what is uh, that waste and residue materials you mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. what are they? Yeah, so we use a wide range of different uh, raw materials and we source them globally and we use them in our different production facilities. Uh, and it's mainly waste and residue parts and we have a couple of them here. So we have uh, used cooking oil, that's something we can collect from restaurants and other places where, uh, um, where fryers are and so on. So it's, it's one of our biggest uh, raw materials. Uh, we also have uh, food waste uh, oil here and uh, brown grease, also an example. Uh, but I would also say like uh, waste from um, uh, animal fats uh, so, uh, and f waste from fish industries and things like that. So those type of raw materials goes into the production of our, our renewable diesel. And I saw on uh, Nesta's website about the special technology, uh, Nesta's next generation biomass to liquid technology. Yeah. And as I understand, this is exactly uh, transforming raw materials into renewable diesel. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe you could explain a little bit detail. Yeah, so, so how do we go from uh, used cooking oil to a uh, renewable diesel or HV100 product? Uh, yes, we use our next BTL process, uh, but the first thing we do is that we have to clean these uh, uh, raw materials, so we have to get rid of any impurities, like it could be metals in there or, or As food. As you can actually see yeah. here that it's transparent. <laughs> yeah, uh, there could be like food waste still in there, so and that could hurt our catalyst. So, so first we go through a process where we clean the raw materials. Uh, and then going into this next BTL process, uh, the first thing we do that these have oxygen in them. And oxygen is not something we want to have in the end product, because mm. if we have oxygen, it easily starts to grow in the tank or create problems. So we use hydrogen to remove the oxygen. So that's the first step in that process. And in the second step, that's the isomerization phase, uh, that is basically where we tailor these hydrocarbons into the properties that we want to really get this uh, premium high quality end product. Uh, so that, that's, the, that's the second phase. And by doing this, we, we can take really low grade waste and turn it into a high quality fuel. And then who can actually use this end product uh, in their vehicles? Any kind of passenger car, uh, trucks, planes? Uh, like yeah. who could be the <laughs> people or companies that utilize it? Yeah, so wherever you have a diesel engine, whether it's a backup generator, a diesel train, a diesel truck, a bus or a car, 
uh, you can use this product. So it, it works, it has the same properties. Uh, it, it's just a, cl a cleaner product, so it doesn't have any impurities or any aromatics, which is positive because aromatics is something you don't want. So it burns much cleaner with less soot, uh, which can also lead to less need of maintenance uh, of the vehicle or the engine. Uh, and it's also great in storage, as I mentioned, because it has no oxygen in it, so there's no problem with the growth in the tanker, and so, so it can be stored for a long time. And it also has a really nice uh, winter quality, so you can use it in cold weather conditions also. That's good <laughs> for countries like Lithuania and I believe Sweden yeah, or yeah. Finland. Yeah, I'm just really curious, how do you collect them? Like, <laughs> yeah. where, where do they actually, the cooking oil? Yeah. And what do we have here? Brown grease. Yeah. I, I, I cannot imagine how it actually comes to nest this facility, let's say. And yeah. How does it? <laughs> how does it happen? Yeah, it, it's not that advanced actually. There are uh, big fleets of trucks going in around to restaurants and picking up this waste. Mm. And uh, in, in some cases, we we, buy, uh, we we own the companies that uh, collects the waste, and in some camp, uh, in some cases, we just buy it from from the market. Uh, of course, first being controlled uh, by us that it's uh, all sustainable. Uh, so, and we collect this globally, so in, in the US, in Europe, in, uh, in Asia and so on. So it's, it's really a global operation to get a hold of these raw materials. Now it makes more mm. sense. Mm. <laughs> uh, so as I see, um, this is the HVO, right? Yeah. And this is the fossil fuel. Yes. Yeah. So it even looks a little bit different. Maybe you could uh, outline the differences a little bit more, rather just not not just the visual one, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, just by looking on for, on them, you see a little bit difference in in color between the two. So the Nestemai Renewable Diesel is a bit clearer. It looks almost like water, but you shouldn't drink it still. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, there is uh, some differences here that it's it's a more uh, purer product, it con contains no impurities and it also has no aromatics and aromatics are cancerogenic so that's something you don't want, it doesn't smell. So just from the handling standpoint it's e nicer to handle for the operators and, and so on. Uh, and then when you burn it, it, it's, uh, collect or it creates less soot so it burns much cleaner, uh, so that's also, also nice. Um, but of course the biggest thing you can't see here and that is the greenhouse gas reduction. It's not visible by just looking at the product, but uh, the biggest thing is of course the up to 90% greenhouse gas emissions that we have with our product. Okay, thank you. <laughs> but uh, it's not visible, but how do we actually know, how do we check that it's um, up to 90% greenhouse gas uh, emissions reduction? Yeah, so depending on the raw materials we use, uh, we get different uh, values and it's uh, in this case uh, determined by EU legislation how we should calculate uh, and that brings us to the number. Uh, and we have uh, both average values that we achieve uh, per year, but also per batch that we produce. We have a proof of sustainability with the actual values that, that is achieved. Uh, and then, of course, when we do climate reporting or help our customers to do climate reporting, they get the, the values uh, that they can use in their reports. So. so if we further compare these uh, uh, fuels, uh, what does it mean in terms of uh, fuel consumption? Can we also go long distances with HVO? Yeah, so you can use it the same, same thing as fossil diesel and the fuel consumption is basically the same. It can be plus minus a couple of percent uh, depending on uh, the engine and how it's set up and so on because the properties differ a little bit. Uh, so we have a higher C10 number but less density and all this sort of comes together with basically the same fuel consumption. I would say most customer doesn't see any difference at all. So you get the same range as you have with a, with a normal diesel fuel, fossil diesel fuel. So. Because as you mentioned, uh, at the moment there is no uh, single solution that could uh, make the world sustainable. So for instance, uh, maybe electric trucks are good for those who want to transport uh, cargo in short distances, but for instance, HVO could be a solution to go longer distances, right? Yeah, definitely. I think we should use the solutions where it makes sense. So if you have access to 
green electricity and the right infrastructure with charging stations and so on and the right routes uh, and so on I think definitely electrification should be used. Uh, we at Nest are also building uh, charging infrastructure uh, so definitely but uh, also seeing that using the solution where they make sense so if you have a more long haulage in areas where uh, you have less infrastructure and so on and you, you need the range uh, then definitely uh, renewable diesel or HVO makes makes a good a good solution for it. And speaking about the technology, do you have your own R&D department that um, basically creates that technology? Yes, uh, innovation and R&D is a, is a crucial part of Nest and we, we filed the first patents for the next BTL technology, for example, over 25 years ago and working on these new raw materials and new technologies is a key part of the R&D that we're doing. Uh, and we have an extensive amount of patterns in, in this area and also working on new technologies. So definitely this is something we're doing. But also in the R&D section, uh, I would say collaborations are key because we can't do everything by ourselves. So we have plenty of good uh, collaborations also with different companies and institutes uh, in the R&D area. Maybe you could tell me, just to understand the scale, uh, approximately how much HVO is produced in Europe. Mm -hmm. And let's say if every vehicle, like, I don't have a car, but like if I decide mm -hmm. tomorrow that I want to use HVO and all my colleagues decide to use HVO, everyone decides to use HVO tomorrow, mm -hmm. is it possible? Yeah, so if we start with the production volumes, we are really scaling up the production. So we produce in, in Finland, in Rotterdam in the Netherlands and also in Singapore. And then we have a joint operation in California, in Martinez. And we right now have a production capacity of 5.5 million tons. Uh, and last year we added a lot of capacity in both uh, Singapore and in California to get us up to 5.5. Uh, and in 2026, we will add additional capacity in our refinery in, in Rotterdam, so coming up to 6.8 million tons. Uh, and by doing this, we will have in uh, basically in a three year period, uh, doubled our, more than doubled our production capacity, mm -hmm. which is, uh, I think it's a quite big uh, step for us to take. Uh, then coming back to, is it enough for everybody? I mean, so far, the companies and people want to use it, it's available and there is enough. But if to replace all the fossil diesel in the world, uh, there's not enough <laughs> right now. But there is potential to scale up and do more. But I should also, I mean, I believe that there needs to be a mix of solutions here. There, there's not a single solution that can replace everything. So whether it be electrification, hydrogen, e-fuels or, or HVO, uh, there's not a single one of them that will replace everything. So I think we, we'll, we will need a, a mix of these solutions. But for those people who are willing, for example, to use uh, HVO, uh, you mentioned there is no special equipment needed. So there is no investment needed? Um, no, I, this, this switch is really easy to make and you can use both your existing vehicles, uh, your existing infrastructure. If you have a filling station or a tank, uh, you can keep the same. Uh, so there's really no, no investments needed, it's just to make the switch. So it's uh, I would say really easy to make the change here. Mm. And as I understand, it's kind of flexible with blending it with fossil fuels like HVO100 uh, or... Yeah, so uh, the, the product blends with the fossil diesel. So you can blend it from uh, zero to 100% in any way you want. So it doesn't matter if you would happen to have uh, already half the tank with the fossil diesel and then you fill up with HVO, it's not no problem. It blends mm. and it works. So you can blend it any way you want. So HVO 100 actually means that it's 100% yeah. HVO. Th that's the 100% product and that is when you get the, the most greenhouse gas reduction. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you want to have the best greenhouse gas reduction, you go for the 100% product. Yeah.